Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2022. The series is titled On Death, Dying and the Future Hope. The author is Dr. Alberto Tim, while your readers are Percy and Sibella Harold. Welcome to lesson number six, ready for teaching on November 4. It's titled, He Died for Us, and I'm Percy Harold. By my calculations, this is the 1400th episode that I've read for the blind since 1996, and the 800th that has been podcast since 2007. Welcome. Sabbath afternoon, October 29. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is one of the best lessons that we're going to have this quarter. We thank you that this lesson is about Jesus. This lesson is about his death, his resurrection, and what it means for us. And as we open your word this week, we pray that our trust and our hope in Jesus will continue to grow and that our faith in you will be strengthened and that we may look forward to that day when Jesus will come to receive those who are his at the second coming. We pray that your spirit will guide each one of us as we turn the leaves of your word this week. And particularly, I'd like to pray today for those who are listening in Oregon in the United States, Hamilton in New Zealand, Kampala in Uganda, Montevideo in Uruguay, Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, Chennai in India, Bangkok in Thailand, Kabul in Afghanistan, and Tallinn in Estonia. Lord, there are people listening in just so many quarters of the world, and I pray that each of us may be blessed as we study your word together this week. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our memory text this week is John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let's read that again. John 3, verses 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It has been said that we cannot avoid death and taxes. That's not entirely true. People can avoid taxes, but not death. They might be able to put death off a few years, but sooner or later, death always comes. And because we know that the dead, both the righteous and the wicked, end up in the same place at first, our hope of the resurrection means everything to us. As Paul has said, without this hope, even those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished in 1 Corinthians 15.18, which is a rather strange thing to say if those who have fallen asleep in Christ are buzzing about heaven in the presence of God. Thus, Christ's resurrection is central to our faith because in his resurrection we have the surety of our own. But, before Christ was resurrected from the dead, he, of course, had to die. This is why, amid the agony of Gethsemane, in anticipation of his death, he prayed, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. John twelve twenty seven, And that purpose was to die. This week, we will focus on Christ's death and what it means for the promise of eternal life. Sunday, October 30. From the foundation of the world. Read Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, Acts 2, 23, and 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20. How could Christ be considered slain from the foundation of the world? Revelation 13, verse 8, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world.
And Acts chapter 2 verse 23, Him, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. And 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 19 and 20, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Revelation 13.8 read, All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. What's crucial here for us is the idea of Christ being slain from the foundation of the world. Obviously, we must understand this in a symbolic sense. The book of Revelation is full of symbols. Because Christ wasn't crucified until thousands of years after the earth's creation. What this text is saying is that the plan of salvation had been put in place before the creation of the world. And central to that plan would be the death of Jesus, the Lamb of God, on the cross. Read Titus chapter 1 verse 2. What does this verse teach us about how long ago the plan of salvation which centred on Christ's death had been in place? Titus chapter 1 verse 2, in hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised before time began. The plan for our redemption, Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 22, was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages had been the foundation of God's throne. End of quote. That plan was revealed first to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and it was typified by every blood sacrifice throughout the Old Testament. We read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And verse 21, Also for Adam and his wife the Lord God made tunics of skin, and clothed them. For instance, while testing Abraham's faith, God provided a ram to be sacrificed instead of Isaac. And we read that in Genesis chapter 22, verses 11 to 13. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. This replacement typified even more clearly the substitutionary nature of Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross. Thus, Central to the whole plan of salvation is the substitutionary death of Jesus, symbolised for centuries by animal sacrifices, each one a symbol of Jesus' death on the cross as the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, as it says in John 1.29. And so, to finish today, animal sacrifices are gruesome and bloody. That is true. But why is this gruesomeness and bloodiness precisely the point, teaching us about Christ's death in our place and what the terrible cost of sin was. Monday, October 31, A Preface to the Cross What were the reactions of the disciples to Jesus' predictions of his own sufferings and death, and what should their reaction teach us about the dangers of misunderstanding Scripture? First of all, we look at Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 23. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, 
and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are an offence to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of God. Of man. And then Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 32. Then they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want any one to know it. For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and after he is killed he will rise the third day. But they did not understand this saying, and were afraid to ask. And Luke chapter 9, verses 44 and 45. Let these words sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden from them, so that they did not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about his saying. And then Luke 18 verses 31 to 34. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, We are going to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken." Jesus was born to die, and he lived to die. Every step that he took brought him closer to his great atoning sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. Fully conscious of his mission, he did not allow anyone or anything to distract him from it. In reality, as we read in Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 382, his whole life was a preface to his death on the cross. End of quote. In the last year of his earthly ministry, Jesus spoke more and more explicitly to his disciples about his forthcoming death, but they seemed unable and unwilling to accept the reality of his statements. Filled with false notions about the role of the Messiah, the last thing that they had expected was for him, Jesus, especially as the Messiah, to die. In short, Their false theology led them into needless pain and suffering. Already to Nicodemus, Jesus had declared, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 14 and 15. While in Caesarea Philippi, Jesus told his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day in Matthew 16.21. Passing privately through Galilee, we read about in Mark 9, and during his final journey to Jerusalem, we read in Luke 18, Jesus spoke again to his disciples about his death and resurrection. Because it was not what they wanted to hear, they didn't listen. How easy it is for us to do the same. And so to finish the day, people, especially God's chosen people, had false concepts regarding the first coming of the Messiah. What are some of the false concepts out there today regarding the second coming of Jesus? Tuesday, November 1. It is finished. Read John chapter 19, verses 1 to 30. What is the crucial message to us in Jesus' statement, It is finished? 
John 19, beginning at verse 1, So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the praetorium, and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing the cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the centre. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Finally, the crucial moments for Christ, for humankind and for the whole universe, had arrived. With deep agony, he struggled against the powers of darkness. Slowly he made his way through the Garden of Gethsemane, through his unfair trials, and up the mountain of Calvary. 
Evil angels were trying to overcome him. While Jesus was hanging on the cross, the chief priests, the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. Matthew 27 verse 42 Could Christ have come down from the cross and saved himself? Yes, he was able, but not willing to do so. His unconditional love for all humanity, including those mockers, did not allow him to give up. Actually, the mockers, we read in an exegetical commentary on the Gospel according to St. Matthew by Alfred Plummer, page 397, the mockers were among those whom he was dying to save, and he could not come down from the cross and save himself, because he was held not by the nails, but by his will to save them. End of quote. Here, in the suffering of Christ, Jesus was defeating the kingdom of Satan, even though it was Satan who had instigated the events that led to the cross, including Jesus' betrayal, as we read in John chapter 6, verse 70. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? And John 13, verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him. And verse 27, Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. Georgie Ladd, in A Theology of the New Testament, page 192, writes, Somehow, in a way the evangelist does not try to describe, the death of Jesus is both an act of Satan and an act in which Jesus wins the victory over Satan. End of quote. Crying from the cross, it is finished in John 19 verse 30, Christ implied not only that his agony had come to an end, but also especially that he had won the great cosmic historic controversy against Satan and his evil forces. Ellen White wrote in The Desire of Ages, page 758, All heaven triumphed in the Saviour's victory. Satan was defeated and knew that his kingdom was lost. End of quote. It's hard to grasp the amazing contrast here. In the utter humiliation of the Son of God, he had won. For us and for the universe, the greatest and most glorious victory. And so to finish today, Think about how bad sin must be that it took the death of Christ to atone for it. What should this truth teach us about how useless our works are for attaining merit before God? After all, what can we do to add to what Christ has already done for us? Bring your answer to class on Sabbath. Wednesday, November 2. He died for us. Read John chapter 3, verses 14 to 18, and Romans 6, 23. What do these verses teach? That Christ's death has accomplished for us. John 3, beginning at verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
When Jesus arrived at the Jordan River to be baptised, John the Baptist exclaimed in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This statement acknowledged Christ as the antitypical Lamb of God to whom all true sacrifices of the Old Testament pointed. But animal sacrifices could not take away sins by themselves, as we read in Hebrews 10.4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. They only provided conditional forgiveness dependent on the effectiveness of Christ's future sacrifice on the cross. If we confess our sins, we read in 1 John 1 verse 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Read John chapter 3 verses 16 and 17. What great hope can we take from these verses, especially when we rightly sense that we deserve to be condemned for something that we have done? John 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Think about what all this means. Jesus, the one who created the cosmos, as we read in John 1, 1 to 3, offered himself for each of us a sacrifice for sins, all so that we don't have to be condemned for what we could justly be condemned for. This is the great promise of the Gospel. Let's read John 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Jesus Christ declared that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son to die for us in John 3.16. But we should never forget that Christ offered himself voluntarily on our behalf, as we read in Hebrews 9.14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Martin Luther referred to the cross as... The altar on which he, Christ, consumed by the fire of the boundless love which burned in his heart, presented the living and holy sacrifice of his body and blood to the Father with fervent intercession, loud cries and hot, anxious tears. That's from Luther's Works, Volume 13, page 319. Christ died once for all, as we read in Hebrews 10.10. 10. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And once forever, we read in verse 12 of Hebrews 10. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. For his sacrifice is all-sufficient and never loses its power. And there's more. Ellen White writes in the Ministry of Healing, page 135. If but one soul would have accepted the gospel of his grace, Christ would, to save that one, have chosen his life of toil and humiliation and his death of shame. And so to finish the day, read John 3.16, replacing the words the world and whoever with your own name. How can you learn moment by moment, especially when tempted to sin, to make this wonderful promise yours? Well, let's read John 3.16 and this time I'm going to put in my name. For God so loved Percy that he gave his only begotten son, that when Percy believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I'd like to read that again, this time from the New Living Translation, and I'm going to put a different name in there. The most frequent commenter on the podcast is Samsung Blue, and this is for you. 
For this is how God loved Samsung Blue. He gave his one and only son, so that Samsung Blue, who believes in him, will not perish, but have eternal life. Thursday, November 3, The Meaning of the Cross Read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18-24. to 24. What is Paul saying about the cross, and how does he contrast it with the wisdom of the world? Why, even today, when materialism, the idea that all reality is only material, which means that there is no God or supernatural realm of existence, dominates the wisdom of the world? is the message of the cross so important? 1 Corinthians 1, beginning at verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God, through the foolishness of the message preached, to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of of God. The cross is the very centre of salvation history. From his book The Cross and Its Shadow, Stephen N. Haskell, one of our early leaders, wrote in the Bible Training School of 1914 on page 5, Eternity can never fathom the depth of love revealed in the cross of Calvary. It was there that the infinite love of Christ and the unbounded selfishness of Satan stood face to face. End of quote. While Christ was humbly offering himself as a ransom for the human race, Satan was selfishly engulfing him in suffering and agony. Christ did not die just the natural death that every human being has to face. He died the second death, so that all those who accept him will never have to experience it for themselves. In regard to the meaning of the cross, there are several important aspects that we should remember. First, the cross is the supreme revelation of God's justice against sin, as we read in Romans 3, verses 21 to 26. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Second, the cross is the supreme revelation of God's love for sinners, Romans 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Third, the cross is the great source of power to break the chains of sin, as we read in Romans 6, 22-23. But now, having been set free from sin, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness, and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus 
our Lord. And 1 Corinthians 1, verses 17 to 24. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Fourth, the cross is our only hope of eternal life. As you read in Philippians chapter 3 verses 9 to 11, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead and John three fourteen to sixteen and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And First John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And fifth, the cross is the only antidote against a future rebellion in the universe. As you read in Revelation 7, verses 13 to 17, Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat, for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And Revelation 22 verse 3 and there shall be no more curse, for the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. None of these crucial truths about the cross can be discovered by the wisdom of the world. On the contrary, then, as now, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to worldly wisdom, which often doesn't even acknowledge the most obvious truth there could be that a Creator exists. See Romans 1, verses 18 to 20. Beginning at verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The Greek word for foolishness is linked to the English word moron, that is, the preaching of the cross is moronic according to the wisdom of the world. Worldly wisdom cannot know Jesus or the salvation that he offers us through his substitutionary death on the cross. And so to finish the day, 
Whatever value some worldly wisdom can offer, why must we never let it interfere with what we believe about Jesus and the hope we're offered through the foolishness of the message preached, as it says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21. Friday, November 4. From Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 124, we read, I saw that all heaven is interested in our salvation, and shall we be indifferent? Shall we be careless, as though it were a small matter whether we are saved or lost? Shall we slight the sacrifice that has been made for us? Some have done this. They have trifled with offered mercy, and the frown of God is upon them. God's Spirit will not always be grieved. It will depart if grieved a little longer. After all has been done that God could do to save men, if they show by their lives that they slight Jesus' offered mercy, death will be their portion and will be dearly purchased. It will be a dreadful death, for they will have to feel the agony that Christ felt upon the cross to purchase for them the redemption which they have refused and they will then realise what they have lost, eternal life and the immortal inheritance. The great sacrifice that has been made to save souls shows us their worth. When the precious soul is once lost, it is lost forever. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Hebrews 10.4 says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So... How were people saved in Old Testament times? How can the analogy of a credit card which you use to make payments but later on have to pay for the credit card bill help us better understand this subject? 2. Read 2 Corinthians 5, 18-21 If Christ died for the sins of the whole world, why won't everyone be saved? Why does personal choice play a crucial role in determining who will be saved by the cross and who will be lost despite the great sacrifice made in their behalf? 2 Corinthians 5, beginning at verse 18. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 3. What are some things that worldly wisdom teaches that are foolishness to God? What about the idea that all the incredible design and beauty of the world is purely a chance creation, or that the universe arose from absolutely nothing? What other examples can you think of? And 4. Think about the final question on Tuesday's study. What about the cross and what happened there makes the idea of salvation by work so futile, so erroneous and so contrary to the plan of salvation? And now, with Inside Story, is Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Turning the Other Cheek by Rick McEdward Omar, a university student in the Middle East, desperately needed a job, but he wasn't ready to do just anything to get hired. During a job interview, he openly told the company representative that he could not work on Saturdays because that was his holy day. The company representative did not blink. That's fine, he replied. We don't need you. It was true. National unemployment was so high that the company didn't need Omar. 
Many people were looking for work and it would be easy to find someone willing to work on Saturdays. Sadly, Omar left the company's office. Omar was a new believer who just days earlier had given his life to Christ. He had mingled with believers for six years and searched the Bible before making his decision. After the job rejection, he bought a three-wheeled cart with a plan to make money by selling simit, a circular bread covered with sesame seeds. Omar's Sabbath-keeping friends were touched by his faithful stand for Jesus and began to pray for him. A few days later, Omar announced excitedly that the company had called him back and offered him the job with Saturdays off. He was so excited that he decided to find at least one person a day to tell about Christ. Sipping a drink at a local cafe a few days later, he and an elderly man began to talk about religion. Omar shared his journey from his family's traditional holy book to the Bible and the incredible peace that he had found. As Omar left the cafe, a man who had overheard the conversation from a nearby table followed him. I can't believe that you could say such things, the man yelled. Are you not ashamed? You grew up in our country and know better. The man began to beat Omar with his fists. Later that day, when a Sabbath-keeping friend video called Omar, he was greeted by a large swollen eye and an even larger smile of joy. You could have called the police, the friend said. Yes, Omar said, but Jesus tells us to turn the other cheek. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also, as quoted in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 and 39. This mission story illustrates mission objective number two of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to strengthen and diversify Adventist outreach across the 1040 window and to non-Christian religions. Read more at IWillGo2020.org. Omar is a pseudonym. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.